As an educator, I have the unique opportunity to serve as a sorcerer for student services, blending the abstract with concrete takeaways. A wordsmith, materializing language that accurately ex describes experiences from the margin and places them into the light. A hope dealer, identifying learning and the silver lining of the darkest of clouds. All of this to say that in my role, I'm provided with a unique perspective on the lives of students every day. I see, hear, and support students as they navigate conflicting experiences, thoughts, and values, all of which constantly remind me of the reimagining we must process in order to pursue an intended goal. Yet when I think about the most profound learning I've personally experienced, it's not in serving as a conduit for information, but rather in the process of learning about my journey and the young people I work alongside. It is through my experience as a student that I stand here with you today and encourage you to join me in this reflective process. By a show of hands, how many of us in this room have made a mistake in the process of pursuing a goal? Okay, so that's a fairly good amount of hands, but just to be expected. Now when you think about that mistake, how many of us in this room immediately started overthinking the moment it happened? You know, when your mind starts creeping with thoughts that make you question your ability, the million other ways you could have handled the situation, or even the constant questioning that you might be a fraud in disguise. I know I'm guilty of responding exactly like this, which is why I want to talk to you all today about how we go from overthinking about our mistakes and failures to making meaning of them through the eye of our success. Merriam Webster defines success as any desirable outcome and or the attainment of favor, wealth, and eminence. Similarly, Google defines the term as any accomplishment of a purpose or aim. For this discussion, we will define success as any moment personal accomplishment or achievement that contributes to an intended change in behavior or outcome. While this definition certainly isn't exhaustive, it allows us to think a little bit more critically about the goals we set and how do we respond when things don't go according to plan. As I alluded to earlier, my story more formally starts at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where I was challenged to think a little bit more about who I was and what that meant for me moving forward. Essentially, like so many of the young people I work with, I was the overly involved student that did everything and never turned down an opportunity. While pursuing my degree, I was actively involved with any endeavor that allowed for me to connect with others, build my skill set, and collectively contribute to the university community. Yet, to my surprise, I found that the more I did, the less I felt like I was accomplishing anything. The more success I achieved, the less content I became. And the more my achievements and accomplishments entered the public eye, the more pressure I felt to uphold the responsibility and expectations of those around me. While at the time I couldn't accurately define these experiences, I later learned they were oddly similar to the imposter phenomenon or syndrome. The imposter phenomenon was initially conceptualized in 1978 by Pauline Rose Plants and Susan Imes. Dr. Imes and Dr. Clance initially highlighted in their research that high-achieving women would attribute their success to matters such as luck, subsequently feeling like they would eventually be found out for their perceived lack of credentials. In their research, they highlight that women would be significantly more predisposed to these feelings of inadequacy than their male counterparts. But more information has suggested that everyone has these feelings of inadequacy and feelings of being an imposter, and particularly people from historically marginalized identities. And learning more about the phenomenon, I found that one of the biggest factors that contributes to these feelings of inadequacy are environments and communities that overemphasize perfection, excellence, and natural ability as a prerequisite for success. Similarly, environments that criticize or praise people according to their achievements or lack thereof, ultimately assigning value to someone based on their outcomes. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear this, I inherently think about college campuses collectively and our culture of excellence specifically. And looking at my development in retrospect, I was caught up in this environment, but had no real perspective on how to counteract these feelings of inadequacy. And what made matters worse is that my insecurities would be rationalized by the outcome. What I mean by that is that in moments where I failed to uphold my responsibilities, Rather than reflect on the mistake or failure, 
I looked for the next title, the next involvement opportunity, and the next goal. Rather than finding joy in the process, I found that I was more preoccupied with distancing myself from any semblance of a failure. And while at the time it may have seemed that it was okay, I was entering this moment in space where I felt like I was alone and no one really understood what was going on. A perfect illustration of this cycle for me as a person and student was when I served in a mentor capacity for a leadership development program on campus. As part of my role for being a mentor, I was required to communicate and connect with our leadership community, support my mentees, and ultimately facilitate an exercise. And when I think and reflect on my job, I did a particularly good job. I felt really confident in my ability to do these things. Um, but I couldn't help but overthink the mistakes that I made along the way. And one that particularly stuck out to me was when I pushed one of my mentees within the learning environment well beyond what they were capable of, ultimately forcing them to disengage, lose a lot of trust in me, and not see me as a support system. Now this was something that I could have probably reflected on more effectively if I just knew how to respond appropriately. Rather than hold myself accountable to my actions and finding a, an opportunity to communicate my error with my mentee, I looked for the next involvement opportunity that allowed for me to look like a success in front of my peers. I allocated energy, time, and development to other areas because I knew people really liked that part of me. Ultimately creating a situation where my responsibilities as a mentor to the person that I had communicated with, connected with, and committed to supporting fell to the wayside. Now this pattern continued for some time for me personally until I received some very well-directed criticism from a mentor. And by well-directed criticism, one of my mentors really had, really, really gave it to me. Um, and if anything I've said up until now has given you any idea, it's safe to say that I didn't necessarily take this criticism well. But when discussing how I showed up in learning environments, they told me that I was arrogant, I had an inability to listen, and my voice took up a lot of space. But rather than actually listen to this feedback and think about what the next action steps might be, I ironically felt inclined to defend myself with my resume, accessing the brevity and depth of my experiences as a way to cover the wounds on my self-esteem, utilizing the multiple touch points to various communities as a way to triangulate a response that allowed for me to save face. And while at the moment it felt like it was all right, my world had completely shifted. Someone I looked up to had challenged me in a way I wasn't necessarily capable of handling at the time. But what they responded with next actually planted the seed for this discussion. My mentor simply replied, rather than tell me what you have done, show me how much you have learned. However simple this initial reframe may sound, it completely altered my perception of meaning making. I was forced to reevaluate how I viewed success and my learning within that context. So rather than using my success and my accomplishments as a way to avoid my mistakes and failures, I started to use it as a center of my self-inventory. Similarly to how the eye of the storm is known for lower pressures, a state of calmness, and vastly different conditions than its subsequent surroundings, I started to utilize the center and eye of my success to hold myself accountable to the process. What I mean by this is that every accomplishment, goal, and milestone, however small or large, I started to use it as an anchor for development. This initially meant that I started to give myself the same grace I extended to my mentors and idols. I no longer bashed myself continually for making mistakes and failures, but rather started to think, how would I respond differently if a similar situation came up? This then transitioned to honing my passion areas. I no longer wanted to seek out titles and involvement opportunities just for the sake of doing so, but wanted to pursue fulfillment. I analyzed and questioned 
where I was getting the most love, energy, and passion from, I pursued that instead. Lastly, I stopped looking at the outcome as the sole proprietor or measurement for success. Rather, I started to look at the connections, the people, the situations, and the perseverance necessary in order to create change. These lessons and changes and thought processes took some time for me to develop. And undoubtedly, mistakes and failures will continue to creep within your mind, your thought process, and context as you navigate a particular goal. But through the eye of your success, you have the opportunity to reframe obstacles to future lessons, to build and enhance a sense of self by magnifying your growth, and to be a more self-conscientious person by reflecting on your process. As Confucius once said, it is better to be a diamond with a flaw than a pebble without. Thank you.